Hi again then guys and welcome to episode 2 of a series which we started a couple of weeks ago, kind of a surprise drop that I didn't announce ahead of time, Circuit Strategies. This is a series where, as I said in that first episode, we're going to break down some of the most challenging circuits, often some of the larger circuits as well, in the Gran Turismo franchise, but you can also use the tips and tricks that I'm giving in pretty much any racing game that features the track in question. So this video, for instance, is primarily for GT Sport, but by all means, you could use it for anything between Gran Turismo 4 and Gran Turismo Sport, or you could use it for Forza, you could use it for Project Gotham, you could use it for any game which features this track. But in particular, I am using Gran Turismo Sport as the primary example. Now, the first episode, for those who haven't seen it, covered a track which you wouldn't really think even needs a tutorial. Special Stage Route X. It's just a big oval, so how challenging can it really be? And yet, as I clearly showed in that video, and as many of you know already from racing there, it's a lot more challenging than you'd think. Not because the track itself is difficult, but because the racing is so close that the difference between a win and a loss is tiny. Whereas on some tracks like Le Mans or Sierra and Gran Turismo 6, for instance, or even here on the NURB, the track is much longer. You've got more corners, and that works to your favor. Now, the funny thing about the Nordschleife in particular, which is what we're going to focus in on in this video, because I'll probably do a video just for the GP course, which kind of makes the idea of doing the 24-hour course a little bit redundant. If you want to know how to take on that track, the larger variation, then basically just combine what I'm saying in this video with what I'll say in that video whenever we get around to it. So, for this one in particular, like I said, I'm focusing in on the Nordschleife. Now, a little bit of a background lesson, because it can be beneficial. The track was released in 1927, open to the public, open to racing. It involved 3,000 people building the track. It can hold 150,000 spectators. This is a serious circuit. It's massive, it's legendary, it is notorious, and it is certainly challenging. But the funny thing about the Nordschleife in particular, but you could argue even more so the 24-hour course because of its even larger size, it's not so much that the track or any of its specific corners are unbearably difficult, it's more so that less experienced drivers tend to get fatigued, and that fatigue alone is what causes a lot of the mistakes. Looking behind at your opponents all the time, going off track because you decided to, or not decided, but misjudged a braking distance, tried to overcook your speed into a corner, all of these things add up, and the longer the lap, the more opportunity there is for said mistakes. So, as always, I've put all the time codes for the specific breakdown points in this video because we talk about a number of different things, the general overview, which is what we're doing right now, an actual breakdown of a lap itself, which I'm going to use slowed down footage in, and I'm going to literally break down the entire circuit corner by corner, and then just a, a couple of pointers at the end as far as tuning, endurance racing, things to be careful of, how to combat bad drivers, that kind of thing. So, as I said, I'm going to break down the full lap, and I'm going to use an N200 Honda Integra. So it's not going to be the fastest lap ever, plus I've slowed down the footage that little bit because I originally recorded this video and it ended up being 32 minutes long. And it was certainly a very in-depth breakdown and I was very happy with it, but it turned out that syncing up with the video didn't really work because I took too long on each individual corner. So instead of that, what we're going to do is kind of a point-by-point play it by sight breakdown where we follow the car in real time or close to it and break it down corner by corner. So as we enter the track now on the opening straight, if you will, right up near the pits, entering the corners are going to be numbered as we go around. There are about 74 corners, so the first corner in particular, you need to be placed nice and wide. You need to break hard, you need to break early, try to turn in, try to clip that curb, Avoid flipping or rolling on the curb in smaller hatchbacks. Now the next two, this initial curving right and then a secondary curving right, in the vast majority of vehicles, be them slow or fast, you can pretty much take it at full throttle. 
or close to it. And that, I would say, is a very important point on the track. It's what we could call a blue corner if you will, and you'll notice on screen that I've numbered the corners and some of them are in blue. Now this compound corner is where you need to prepare ahead, and there are certain sections on the track where running through these almost S-bend layouts require you to think like a chess game. You need to focus on the corner that you're running in, but you need to be thinking and preparing and positioning your car for the corner that is coming rather than the corner that you're in. Because more often than not, it's kind of a, a corkscrew on Laguna Seca kind of scenario, where it's not about how fast you're going into the corner, or even how fast you're coming out of it, it's about how smooth you are and how efficient you are at passing through it. Now this section of the circuit is one of the best parts for speed, but not necessarily one of the best for overtaking. You've got a couple of hilly sections, and it's also a deceptive part of the track. You've got this slow, curving right-hander. The road itself isn't that wide, even though the track itself is, because of the grass. And this corner at the top of the hill is one of the points where I would say it's more of a red-level corner take extreme caution. In effect, it's two right turns connecting each other, and it's so easy to overcook and end up in the grass. Now next up, you've got a very nice long, not quite straight, but certainly a straight enough section to get great speed. Now this point on the track is really good for catching up to AI. The only problem is it's not great for overtaking the AI. So you'll often find two AI drivers next to each other, and you might have some issues overtaking them. Now this corner here, the sweeping left leading into a, basically a hairpin, is another point where you need to be careful, because it's very easy, especially in a supercar or a hypercar, to come into these two corners, first the left and now this very tight right-hander, way too fast. And if you break too late, if you turn too late, and if you just try to go too quick, you will end up in the sand. And anywhere on the track with a grass or sand trap in particular will waste a huge amount of time. Now this section here is one of my personal favorites because technically you've got a left, right, left kind of scenario, sort of a very long stretched out S bend. The reality is you don't really need to treat this section as a corner at all. Take it as straight as you can, clip over the curbs, and you can actually find that you'll save a lot of time compared to the AI, and also open up a nice little bit of a lead. Now this corner, the initial left, also as you'll notice on a slight uphill, then breaking again for the right-hander, that is also deceptive. You need to watch that corner and slow right down as you enter into the left-hand turn. Now this particular S-Bend, which is wide open grass on both sides, is also deceptive. This right-hand corner in particular, when you exit the section, you can easily try to power out too early and once again run way too wide. The trick, of course, around the Nordschleife is not how fast you are through any particular corner, it's about consistency. You don't need to be the best driver in the world on every corner as long as you are good enough overall to keep it consistent and keep it good. That is more often than not how you'll win races. Now this kind of smooth left is a nice occasion where you can look ahead, especially as a, a, a learner, if you will, a, a less experienced driver, and learn how to prepare your car. Get on the right hand side, slow down, cruise it into the left, but also think ahead. You're turning to the right now. You've got a little bit of a dip in the road. You can't quite see what's coming. Slow it down. You've got a tight right-hander, and this section of the track is very good for training your mind and training your eyes to look ahead and prepare for what isn't there yet, especially when there are other people around you. Now this particular corner setup is a really nice little one for making up time. It's really small, shallow S-bend, a little bit of an undulating left to right on the road. That's a great corner for catching up to the AI in particular, but this one is where you really need to be careful. It's a subtle corner, it's a deceptive corner, and it's kind of a compound corner, if you will. A big right-hander made up of like three or four little corners inside of it. And you just need to watch for understeer, especially given that you're coming into this particular left. One of the tightest corners on the whole track, you'll notice just how slow I'm going, regardless of slowing down the footage, but if you get it right, you can swing out, give it the power, and exit that corner very, very nicely. You do need to be particularly careful of that left-hander though, because it's a bottleneck. You will find with a lot of people online, it's an easy place to crash. Now this left as well is kind of deceptive. It's not deadly, because even if you run wide, you'll just bounce off the wall, but be cautious of that. 
And this corner, this right hand very steep uphill section, is I would say probably the most deceptive corner on the track because you'll try to power on too early and it's very easy to catch that outside curb and go onto the grass. You will waste a ton of time trying to fix that, trying to get the car back in line and if it's something like a, a rear-wheel drive sports car you can very easily spin out. Now this section is another nice simple little left-hander Again, the AI slows down a little bit too much, so it's good for catching them up. But once again, you need to be looking ahead, looking to the distance, preparing to slow down. You'll notice I'm keeping it nice and wide, then turning in across the corner and powering out of it, not powering through it. And that's what you need to do with these really tight corners. Don't try to put the power down too early, regardless of how fast or slow, powerful or not powerful, the car is. Now this particular left-hander, it's very long, it's a flowing corner, but in supercars, that's where you need to be careful here. Prototypes can take this section easily, GT cars can take it easily, something even like this Honda, although quick in its own way, it's got good enough handling for this to not really be a section of corners at all. Where you need to be careful is in stuff like Veyrons, or in LaFerraris, or in pretty much any supercar or hypercar because yes, they have the speed of a prototype, but they don't have the cornering. So these seemingly small kinks in the road to the left and to the right are vastly exaggerated to the point of understeer, and it's very easy to go off the track completely. Now this left-hander that we're coming up to now is another one of my favorite corners because you can give it a little bit of brake, throw the car across the apex, power through it and you can save a ton of time. It's a great corner for catching up to people and it's a great corner for advancing your lead and opening up the gap that little bit more. It's also compounded by the fact that this little right hand kink feeds in the exact same way. Real drivers tend to take that right hand corner pretty easily but the AI slows down way too much. Now this corner you'll notice that I make a mistake. I braked a little bit too early and ran that little bit too wide. Now of course it's a front wheel drive car which doesn't help in that regard but again you need to think more ahead of time than I did in that particular corner. Not that it was an awful corner or that I lost too much time but all of those add up. Now this one is the first of, you could say, two carousel sections on the track, but this is easily the more deceptive. Ironically, this particular carousel left is much easier to take with a road car at high speed than it is in something like a prototype, because they require very high speeds to have the most downforce, and they're also very light. So at low speeds, you've got a high revving, very powerful engine, and not that much to ground the tires. So be very careful on the carousel. If you're not confident, then take it wide. Now this little kink in the road to the left leading into another left, but on an uphill section, is another nice little time earner. Again, be careful of how wide you run, but positioning is key. You'll notice I'm right over to the left, then swing it immediately over to the right so that I don't run too wide. And from this point on, around the five minute mark in the lap, this section is probably my favorite on the whole track, because if you get the flow correct, you can just sing through these corners. Whereas if you get one corner wrong, it kind of knocks on to the next one in a domino way. If you take these corners at a measured speed, little bit of braking, ease off the throttle, allow the car to coast to some degree, smooth left to right transitions, don't run too wide, running too shallow is never really a problem, then you will make up a ton of time. And if you're in the lead, you'll find that it helps your lead as well. Now coming up to this section, you're running downhill now, which is relatively rare on this track, and a long sweeping left. You'll notice that I braked earlier and went slower into the corner than you might think, and the reason for that is because it's a very long progressive turn coming into a really sharp right. I do like this corner though because it looks pretty cool, and you've got a nice big amount of runoff. As you can see to the left, you've got the rumble strip, and also it's not uh, not quite even a full grass area. Now turning this right, once again, keep it loose. Don't allow the car to go too wide, ease off the throttle if necessary. Now this corner is an interesting one because it's a left to right uphill transition, but it's not quite even a full corner. It's more like a curve in the road, a very shallow right in particular, but you're going over the crest. You need to be careful of slamming into cars that might have made a mistake because visibility is not necessarily great. Once again, smooth left. But here we have another deceptive corner because primarily there's a dip in the road. And if you break in the dip, 
You won't slow down anywhere near as much as you need to. You'll run wide and it'll go straight into the sand. So exiting the corner, hold off the throttle a little bit, turn in much more sharply into this left than you think you need to because you can very easily run far too wide. Likewise with this one, you've got the dip down, which is a place where most cars will lose that little bit of grip because they're raising up off the tarmac a little bit. Then through this section, in a similar way to the flow that I mentioned earlier, treat it more like a straight line than a section of corners. Try to keep the car as straight as you can, clipping across the apexes rather than wasting time going left to right. This particular right-hander, slow right down, prepare the car to swing through and immediately position it to go left. Because once again, you've got a sand trap, it will waste a ton of time. Don't power on too early, especially in a car that has understeer. Now we come up to the second carousel, and this is an interesting one as well, because it's better in road cars once again. But on the exit of the corner is where you need to be careful right about there because in a race car you'll be going a lot uh, a lot quicker and that little bit of a bump as you exit the carousel can sometimes be enough to send you over too much with understeer and end up grabbing the grass now this one is another compound right you've got that small initial right and then this long flowing right leading into the straight the problem here is you can start to have fatigue. You're thinking, hey, I'm close to the finish line, I've got the straight section. You give it too much power trying to go through and you end up running wide. So be cautious of throttle control. Now on the straight section, of course, there's not too much that I need to tell you. We might even speed the footage up just a little bit here. But overall, on the straights, it depends if you're in the lead, it depends if people are behind you. Now you want to be careful if you are behind someone and trying to catch their slipstream that they don't allow you to, or cause you even, to weave across the road too much. Because if you do that, you'll end up just wasting more time than you make up. If you are in the lead, don't necessarily try to swing all over the place so that people can't slipstream you. Because once again, you'll just waste too much time. Now this corner that's coming up, right at the top of the straight, You've got this seemingly very shallow left-hander. Once again, just like that long flowing left earlier on, supercars and hypercars in particular need to take extreme caution because they do not have the turn in of a prototype or a GT car and they are going far faster than a road car typically will. You can ruin an entire race on a corner like this because you'll go straight off across the grass. This final section as well, going into this smooth right, then into a much sharper left, right, left, right combo. Again, keep the car nice and slow. Don't get overconfident. Don't try and rush to the finish line. Allow the car to coast through that little bit, ease onto the power. And on this last corner before the finish line, watch the railings. It's very easy to turn in too early and slam into them with your wing mirror or with your quarter panel. And then it's across the line. Now, as I've said before, I don't claim to be the fastest of drivers, of course not, but I certainly get plenty of wins on this track. And one of the main reasons why is because although I'm not the fastest of drivers through any particular corner, my consistency is why I get the wins. Because on a track that is this big, this long, and this technical with over 70 corners, about 33 left hand, 40 right hand, it's easy to get fatigued. So if you can keep yourself away from that fatigue, keep yourself under control and focus more on yourself than others, you'll find that your laps will be more consistent and your victories will be smoother. Now entering the final part of my tutorial and my strategy breakdown, what kind of cars do you need? What kind of tuning do you need? And what kind of strategy would you use when it comes to stuff like endurance racing? Well, first of all, for the cars, the beauty of the Nordschleife is that you can literally use anything. It just depends how challenging you want it to be. Now, some cars will really surprise you. For instance, the classic Mini is not the fastest thing in a straight line, but it's so consistently fast through corners with its average speed that it was actually quicker than this Integra, despite being in a lower category. That's something to bear in mind. You'll often see in real life that some of the best laps on the Nordschleife, especially in terms of road cars, are not the most powerful vehicles. So bear that in mind. You don't want something that's just a pure straight line machine because you'll be left in the dust. In terms of tuning your car, well, it's fairly obvious you need a healthy mix of straight line speed and handling, of course. 
but much more so the handling. It really is about the control, and when it comes to choosing your car, I would strongly recommend picking something that is very easy to swap from left to right in quick succession without losing grip. So for instance, a TVR, as an example, or a Shelby Cobra, it's not the kind of car that really likes to go left, right, left, right slalom style because it will just start to slide around. In something like an Integra on the other hand, or on the other hand, or a Focus ST or some other front wheel drive performance car, you can throw them through those corners far more easily. With a race car, of course, you have the advantage of downforce, but once again, focus in on something that you can keep your average speed up with, because the single most important thing about getting a good Nordschleife lap is that average speed. It's not what your top speed is, it's not necessarily even having perfect handling, it's being able to keep your average speed extremely high. And that is why something like the Mini, or this Integra, is so good. In terms of how to counteract bad drivers, well, of course, on a track which is very long, very easy to be fatigued on, and has a relatively narrow road in comparison to how big the track itself is, it is a very easy track to exploit. If you are a bad driver, if you're a troll driver, it's easy to run people off the track, it's easy to block people, so unfortunately, lobbies involving the Nordschleife, or even any other variation of the Nürburgring, it really does depend on having people who take the game seriously, who take etiquette seriously, and who are, to some degree, evenly matched with each other. Now, of course you could say that about any track, but with the Nordschleife in particular, of course that needs to be the case. As far as that goes, if you find yourself in a lobby with one or more really bad drivers, well of course you've got a couple of options. You can respond the way that they do, you can leave the room, or you can try and outperform them. Now, all three of those are valid. Bashing them off the track instead is a way of dealing with it. But you need to be able to guarantee that they're not going to come up behind you again, because every time you meet the other person, the chances of you being crashed off are increased. That's just simple mathematics and statistics and likelihoods. The second option of trying to just leave the room is a simple one, the flight reaction rather than fight, that's certainly legitimate, just find yourself a new lobby. The third one is the one which is often the most satisfying, outperforming a bad driver, it's fun. Even if they don't recognize it, you can still feel good yourself, because if you can get someone riled up on the Nordschleife, it's the perfect track to do it on, because the angrier they get, the more mistakes they will make. And if you're focusing your anger on another driver, you cannot be focusing on your flow. And once you lose that flow on the Nordschleife, it's all over. You'll start to notice them dropping behind you further and further through each corner. So as I've said before, focus on yourself. You are the most important driver on the track, even if you're not the fastest. Because if you're not the fastest, you're not going to win either way. But what you can do is have an honourable race, have a race that feels cool, that looks good, and that has a nice finish for your skill level, regardless of if you actually win. There are plenty of races that I've loved on the Nürburgring, on the Nordschleife in particular, that I haven't won, but I've still thoroughly enjoyed. Because if you find someone who's as good as you, it can be awesome having those battles. Some of the best battles I've ever had, for instance, in Gran Turismo 6, have been with muscle cars. I was in a Chevy Nova, another guy was in a Dodge Charger, and we were neck and neck the whole race. Neither of us bashed the other one around, and I lost, but I still loved it, because it was just that kind of competition. And there are very few tracks which give you the satisfaction of a victory, or even just of a good race, that the Nordschleife does. Now in terms of strategy, of course, in like a one or two lap race, which is what most of the time you'll come across, the strategy is fairly simple. What I've already said, focus on yourself, keep it consistent, don't try and break any world records through every corner, just try not to make too many mistakes. The less mistakes, the faster your average speed will be. In an endurance race, the single biggest piece of advice is remember the size of the track. This circuit is well over 20 kilometers long. The pit only comes in once a lap, so if you miss the pit lane, you really have missed the pit lane. It's not like an oval track where you're going to be there again in a couple of minutes. It's a long lap, and if you start losing fuel, or especially losing tire integrity, it's going to be a long day getting back to those pits. Plus, the pit lane itself is not particularly big or easy to access. It's actually kind of a little challenge in its own right. So just be very cautious and learn to plan ahead. 
As with any track, driving there on your own for some time really does help, so try to log miles, try to log time, and also try to challenge yourself to use different cars, different classes, roads, oh, roads, <laughs> road and race, I should say, and you'll find that your ability will become more rounded over time. But that is it for my thoughts overall. That is my strategy guide, my breakdown, my tutorial, if you will, of how to improve your personal driving and win-loss ratio on the Nordschleife in particular. Of course, stick around for more. I think we'll probably run my personal favorite track in the next episode, Le Mans. And if you haven't checked out the first one on Special Stage Route X, even if you don't race on the track very much, you might find it interesting because there are things about it which might surprise you in terms of just how competitive that track can be. But overall, that's it for this breakdown. Click through here on screen to see the other episodes. And for now, as always, thanks for watching.